Welcome everyone, my name's Sylph, and this is my attempt to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword with only Flying-type Pokemon. The full rule set for this run is listed down below, but put simply, only the first Flying-type encounter in each route or area can be caught. If a Pokemon faints, it must be permanently boxed. No items except held items in battle. Party Pokemon levels are limited to the next Gym Leader or the final League member's Ace. And finally, the battle mode must be put on set at all times. Oh, and for an additional challenge specific to this gen, we won't be allowed to Dynamax. Ah, Pokemon Sword and Shield, undoubtedly the most controversial Pokemon games of all time. You guys have been requesting that we expand out to the 3D games for a while, and I was very curious to know how a hardcore Nuzlocke would operate in these games. Due to the wild area, Pokemon Sword offers us all of these fully evolved flying types. It is a ton of potential encounters, but keep in mind that even having the wrong weather could very well cut some off, so it's very much a game of roulette with these. The flying type is a really cool one, and looking at the gym leaders, it looks like this might be tough. Come to think of it, I've always wondered why flying Pokemon can't just fly out of range of attacks and then just destroy opposing Pokemon at will. You know what can fly you out of range of any threats though? Today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network service that encrypts your online connection to prevent hackers from getting access to your data. Let's face it, whether you're on public Wi-Fi at the local cafe or in your gamer dungeon at home, your internet connection is vulnerable. With over 5,200 servers in 60 different countries, you can connect to Nord and to everyone else, your connection looks like it's coming from somewhere else entirely. Not only does this help you stay safe online and protect your information, but it also has other benefits. Think about it, many TV shows online, such as the Pokemon series, are only available in certain countries. By using NordVPN, you can connect to a server in a particular country that does have access to it, thereby unblocking your favorite shows and bypassing geo restrictions. This also applies to many video games too, preventing your location from restricting what games you can play and where you can play them. The best part about it is Nord provides extraordinarily fast connections with the Nord Links protocol and only takes one click to activate, or even zero if you enable auto connect. I was personally amazed at how fast and efficient it is. To help you protect your connection and unblock the full potential of your internet, I've partnered with Nord to bring you their two-year plan with an extra four months for free with a huge discount using our very own referral link until October 27th. Click the link down in the description below to get access, and a big thanks goes out to Nord for supporting our channel and sponsoring today's video. Let's get into the run. Man, I don't think I've started a new game on Sword since the days of the Dex controversy. Before we continue, let me know what you guys thought of these games in the comments. I'm very curious to know. Personally, I... <clears throat> 14 out of 10. We're just about ready to start off on our adventure and... Okay, that is a straight up box on my back. In Hop's house, we can go check out his... Oh, Jesus! Who are you? She actually scared me. I know Hop's mom is downstairs, Hop just left, and Leon is out doing champion things, so I wasn't expecting to see anybody else in this house. With that, it's time to pick up our starter, and unfortunately none of them get the flying type, so they will have to be boxed pretty soon. Regardless, I decide to join the Grookey gang on this run and nickname it Luke. I almost named it Lukey, but decided against it at the last minute. You're welcome. Leon says to Hop, You spent the whole night with that new partners of yours, right Hop? You two getting on alright? Understanding one another? Maybe even built up a bit of love? Alright, either he's talking about a type of partner that we're unaware of at the moment, or this man needs to go to jail immediately. On Route 1, we can get our first viable encounter of the game, a Rookity. Its evolution line is definitely one of my favorites in Gen 8, making me really excited about this catch. Once caught, I nickname her Leia, and Leia ends up having a modest nature. Are you kidding me? Plus special attack and minus attack. Alright, we are really not off to a good start here, are we? In the lab, we... Mm. This game has been building on me. 18 out of 10. Give me a moment while my player character is just busy calculating his odds with Sonya. While grinding, Leia eventually learns Hone Claws to raise its attack and accuracy. The grind was quite brutal as we caught her at level 3 and there are level 6s in this route, so we very well could have lost the run almost immediately. Moving on to route 2, we can get our second encounter, this time a Hoot Hoot during the day, which feels odd to me. We catch it and nickname her Kanata, and she ends up having a mild nature, plus special attack and minus defense. That's a bit better. In Wedgehurst comes one of the big saviors of the early game, this guy who sells a whole bunch of great berries, so I make sure to stock up big time. At the end of Route 2, we have a rival battle against Hop, and he leads with Wulu as I lead with Leia. Thankfully, since the level cap is level 20, I could kind of overlevel him, and I set up a few Home Claws with Rookity to increase its damage output. This allows us to KO Wulu in one hit with Peck after we took some damage, then his Sobble survives a Peck and hits us with Water Gun to about half before we can take it down as well. 
His final Pokemon is an arch nemesis Rookity whose fate was already sealed. Honestly, thank god for Home Claws, that might have been a rough battle otherwise. After the battle comes one of this game's greatest sins, when characters hand objects to each other except there are no objects in sight. God, that looks awkward. Behind Magnolia's house, we pull off some epic gamer strats to get the payback TM. I am here to talk about Need for Speed um, payback. After which, I was testing to see if I could pull off this crazy glitch that I was actually there watching live when it was first discovered by my friend Electric Alex. Basically, if you run around on this bridge, sometimes the game registers you as going from land to water and activates the bike. Which you don't even have at this point. You don't get the bike until way later on. Honestly, it's still so funny, but unfortunately it does disappear after the next battle that you have. Still really cool though. At the end of our journey on the train from Wedgehurst, we arrive at the massive wild area. Upon arrival, we're given the Pokemon Box Link, which I imagine will be very useful for hardcore Nuzlocks because you don't have to travel to a PC to reorganize your Pokemon anymore. Speaking of which, the wild area of course opens up a host of new encounters, but the thing is, it depends on what the weather is like at the time, so let's see what we get. As appears to be standard in the community, I'm counting each different area within the wild area as a new encounter opportunity. But of course, whatever flying type we see first is what we have to catch. Right away, we find a P-Dove flying around in the air, so I call it down and catch it. I nickname him Han, and it ends up having a Tibbin nature. The plus speed is great, but the minus attack is brutal. The next area is the Dappled Grove, and it turns out it's snowing here, so the first thing I see is a Deli Bird. Interesting. We catch one and nickname it Mala, and Mala has a naughty nature, plus attack, and minus special defense, which is meh. Honestly, Deli Bird is a Pokemon I have definitely not used in game before, and it turns out it only learns Present, which has a chance to heal the opponent, mind you, and Drill Peck via level up, so we'll see how this goes. We can also pick up the Leftovers item, which is great for early game. Now, I wasn't finding any other viable encounters since we only have the first half of the wild area open to us at this point, and I read that all the Pokemon at the Watchtower Ruins were too high level to catch. But I ended up finding a random Drifloon floating around at South Lake, which is pretty darn cool. We catch it and nickname it Youngling, although I forgot the G for some reason, so we'll have to go fix that in a bit. I imagine those of you who have caught on to our whole nicknaming theme here are gonna enjoy this one. Youngling has a jolly nature, plus speed, and minus special attack. Man, these natures are rough. After those encounters, we arrive in Motostoke and... Oh god, why? It's here in this city that we have to endure the opening ceremony for the gym challenge. Now, all I ever hear on Twitter is how hot the Galar gym leaders are, so let's just see about that. Damn, okay. Meh. Ooh, phew. Meh, whatever. Oh my sweet lady, mmm, wow. Since we now overlevel him quite a bit and got access to 60 power pluck, Leia is able to tear through Hop quite well again with the help of an Orenberry, and I think he's starting to realize his efforts are futile. But if I recall correctly, he gets pretty darn tough later on, so I'm not taking him lightly. Before the gym, we have some grinding to do, and... Alright, I don't think I've ever witnessed Big Pecs actually doing something, so that was fantastic. Han gets bonus points for that one. After a tough battle against a Dottler, Leia ends up evolving into a Corvusquire at level 18 shortly before the level cap, which should be a great help. Mm, you son of a b get over here! You wouldn't think it since it's a cave system with rock types, but the Galar Mines is actually the location of our next encounter, a Wuban, which should add some nice psychic coverage to our team. We catch one and nickname it Gamorian, and not only does it have a relaxed nature, plus defense and minus speed, but it also has the Klutz ability, meaning we can't use items on it at all. Dear lord. At the end of the mines is our first battle against Bede, the edgy, well, edgelord from Edgetown. Now Bede has a whole bunch of psychic types, so I decide to lead with Youngling, who has 65 power hex and, with its speed and power, is able to run through every one of his team members with ease, taking minimal damage throughout. Damn. Just after the mines, we can pick up the sharp beak item, which is kind of the ideal item for us, and we arrive in Turfield, the location of our first gym battle. But first, let's have some fun. 5'11", 6 feet. Alright, sorry, I had to. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but you can actually pick up a fantastic item in this town by completing this very strange puzzle where you have to touch the stones in a particular order. If you do it right, you'll get an expert belt, which raises the power of super effective moves by a further 30%. Quite amazing. It's time to head to the Turfield Gym. After wrangling the Wooloos with the utmost of precision, 
Call me Ranch yourself, why don't you? We arrive at the first gym leader, Milo. Now this is a grass type gym, so I wasn't feeling too worried heading into this battle. He leads with a Gossifleur and I send out Corvusquire with the Expert Belt. I go for Home Claws right away and he uses Round, which hardly does anything. I use Home Claws again since I know that we can and he keeps using Round. Not wanting to risk a crit though, I go for Pluck, which is an instant one-hit KO. In comes his Ace, an Eldegoss, which of course immediately Dynamaxes. Let's be honest, this is just a Dollar Tree version of Jump Pluff. I go for Pluck on it, which does just over half, and then he hits us with Max Strike to just 12 HP, but then I remembered, Max Strike lowers our speed, and Eldegoss would definitely outspeed us now. Uh-oh. But I have a plan that might save us. Assuming he's going to use Max Strike again, I switch into Youngling, who's immune, and the prediction works and wastes one of his Dynamax turns. Not only that, but we resist all his other moves, so I hit him with Gust for little damage, and Max Overgrowth does more than half on us even still. His Dynamax turns are up though, so I hit him with one more Gust to get taken to the red, and then I switch into Han, who tanks a Magical Leaf before taking it down with Air Cutter. Alright, that was a little scarier than I thought, not gonna lie, but we came through for our first badge. Now feeling confident from our victory, I went ahead to Route 5 without doing research on the trainers where I ran into a double battle and they had a Clink and Helioptile. Not good at all. In the end, despite my best efforts, Gamorian the Woobat ended up getting KO'd due to an unlucky Charge Beam special attack boost from the Clink. Ouch. First death on the board, but Youngling saved us from that being the end of the run. Thankfully, Route 5 does give us another encounter opportunity as we can find Ninkata here. Now, Ninkata doesn't yet have the flying type, but due to the automatic XP share, we'll be able to level it up without sending it in battle to evolve into Ninjask, a flying type. We catch it and nickname it Greedo, and Greedo has a hasty nature, plus speed and minus defense, which isn't terrible. Shortly thereafter, Kanata hits level 20 and evolves into a beautiful Noctowl, giving us some extra bulk and power for sure. Not too long after that, we have another evolution in the form of Han, who evolves into a Tranquil at level 22. Right before Holbury, we acquire the bike, and if anyone asks, this is definitely the first time we've used it. Yup, no hacking here. Oh god, I forgot how hideous the bike outfit is. Please reject me. I deserve it. Looking idiotic as ever, we arrive in Holbury, the location of the second gym. We have to go find Nessa first, though, and oh god, there she is. Get off the stupid bike. Mm. Hi, Nessa. How are you? Big fan. <laughs> Wait a minute. Amphi? Is that you? I'll save you! While grinding for the gym, Greedo evolves into a Ninjask, and an idea comes to mind for this thing. In Sword and Shield, the move reminder is technically available in every Pokemon Center, so I head there to teach Greedo both Aerial Ace and Baton Pass, which should make him more useful for sure. It's time to face the second gym leader, Nessa the Water Trainer. Looking at her team, the only thing I'm really scared about is her Dreadnought, but it doesn't have rock moves at least, so I come up with a bit of a plan. Let's see how this goes. She leads with a Goldeen, and I send out Greedo. I decide to use Harden right off the bat, and her Goldeen unfortunately gets a crit on its very first attack, but our leftovers help a bit. From there, I load up on Harden and rack up our speed boost ability each turn too, but then she hits us with Water Pulse, and we get confused. Thankfully, I get another Harden off as she now goes for Agility, but we hit ourselves in confusion before getting hit low again. From here, I'm forced to go for Baton Pass, even with the confusion, and thankfully we get it off, and I pass all the boost to Kanata. Two agilities aren't even enough for her Goldeen though, as we still outspeed and air slash Goldeen to death through confusion. Her Aracuda is then a one hit as well, which would have outsped and done massive damage against us otherwise, and in comes the Dreadnought, which she immediately Dynamaxes to create a terrifying threat. Now here I went for Reflect to raise our team's defense, and it goes for max darkness for some reason, which doesn't do too much. I go for Extra Sensory, which doesn't do too much either, and then she goes for Max Darkness again. What in the world? But I begin to realize what she's doing as she's lowering our special defense every time. In comes the Max Geyser now, and I was worried it would be the special Water Gun variant, but based on how little it did, it looks like it was actually the physical Razor Shell. But then, after returning to normal, it uses Water Gun in the rain for huge damage. I know its ability doubles its speed in rain, so two water attacks would decimate anything that we have, so I have to stay in. Our next extra sensory just barely doesn't KO though, and then it brings us to 11 HP before we can then take it out. Whew. A tough battle, but we had a good strategy, I feel. After the battle, Chairman Rose treats Sonya and I to lunch, and man, this must be the most awkward double date of all time. Why is Oleana just hovering over us? 
In the second Galar Mine, we face off against Beat again, and this time I go for Greedo, who has Fury Cutter, which is super effective against everything that she has, and grows in power with each hit. So it was a pretty darn clean sweep. Incredible stuff, although we did get brought below half in the process. The rest of the second mine was quite a challenge due to all the rock types, but at one point I was like, hold on, there's a flying type in here, as a Noibat pops up. We successfully catch one and nickname it Xana, and Xana has a sassy nature, plus special defense, and minus speed. These natures, man, I swear. Although we do have six Pokemon already, since we have a Fire Gym next, I figure Mala the Delibird will be useless there, so this might be a better option. Although Noibat doesn't evolve until level 48, unfortunately. In the hotel in Modestoke, we have our first battle against Marnie, and I accidentally just accepted her battle straight up. Because she leads with two fighting types, I just kinda went with it, and Noibat was sent out first against her Krogunk. Air Cutter takes it down in two hits after we were brought low by Venoshock, and she brings in Scraggy next. I switch into Gerido here, who takes it down in two aerial aces after being brought below half by headbutts. In comes the big threat that I kind of underestimated, Morpico. Unfortunately, our best bug move is Fury Cutter, which is super weak on its first hit, so I'm forced to baton pass our speed boost into Kanata. But Morpico gets a crit on bite to bring us below half. I stay in and decide to go for Reflect after it hits us to just 11 HP. From here, I switch into Leia, but now she uses Thundershock for super effective damage and hits us twice down to a third before we barely do any damage on it. I know there's nothing that we can switch into that, so... I stand and go for Leer to drop its defense in the hope that we can do more damage. It hits us with Thundershock, and we survive on literally 1 HP before we land it. Man, oh man. I have to switch now and figure she might go for priority now that we're so low, so I switch into Han who gets hit by Quick Attack, then use Leer before getting hit by Thundershock to below half, but our Orenberry helps out. Quick Attack then brings it below half and she hits us to 10 HP, but I know there's nothing else I can switch in. I have to go for Quick Attack, but she goes for her own Quick Attack to outprioritize and take down Han. Given his name, I guess I should have figured this would be his fate after all. From there, Greedo is finally able to KO that damn thing. A rough battle. The Motostoke Gym is up next, and after taking on the trainers, I was looking at Kabu's team and realized, I don't think there's a chance, especially since this Gigantamax Centiscorch has a G-Max move that locks you in on the field. I head back to the wild area with an idea, but this is how close we could get to catching Pelipper. And oh man, why can't it just fly over an inch more to us? This makes no sense. Thankfully, after a ton of searching and figuring out weather patterns and encounter areas, it turns out Wingle is now available at the West Lake during normal weather. We catch one and nickname it Poe, and Poe has a lax nature, plus defense, and minus special defense. Not bad. After a ton of grinding, Wingle ends up evolving into a Pelipper and gets the Drizzle ability, which automatically starts rain. I replace Deli Bird yet again, poor thing, and attach the Expert Belt on Poe and head for the Fire-type gym leader, Kabu. He leads with a Ninetales, and I send out Kanata. He burns us with Will-O-Wisp before Air Slash then does a bit less than half. It then uses Ember and gets a crit, and our next Air Slash barely doesn't KO. I then decide to set up Reflect, knowing Arcanine's coming out next before I can then take it out with below half. Arcanine then comes in with the Intimidate, which doesn't do anything to us, really. Then Air Slash does over half as we're brought to 19 HP. I'm forced to switch, though, so I decide now's the time to send in Poe, who starts the rain. Flame Wheel does 1 HP damage before we KO it with Water Pulse after it burns us. In comes his final Pokemon, Scorch, which proceeds to Gigantamax into this terrifying beast. Thankfully, it only has moves that we resist, and Pelipper's Rain Boosted, Expert Belt Boosted, Stab, Super Effective Water Pulse is a 2-hit KO. Without Pelipper, I think that would have been a disaster. But we got the third badge. As a reward, Youngling ends up evolving into a Drift Blim, definitely a big improvement and should be helpful moving forward. Once I collect a whole bunch of Watts, I decide to hit up the Digging Duo now that we have access to them, hoping to power up Pelipper even more with a certain item. And thankfully, we do end up getting it, the Damp Rock, which now extends the duration of our reign to 8 turns. The second half of the Wild Area also grants us a new encounter in Bridgefield, a Gyarados, something that I've been really looking forward to. We catch it and nickname it Ventress, and Ventress has a hardy neutral nature and is going to replace Noibat for now. We then arrive in Hammerlock, the massive castle city in the center of the region. Here we can pick up two great items, the Wise Glasses to boost all special moves by 10%, and the Muscle Band which does the same for physical moves. Here we also discover a battle taking place between a Gastrodon and a Rhydon. My dude, you're gonna get f***ed up. I also use the Move Reminder to teach Gyarados Ice Fang which should provide us some great coverage. 
After Team Yell and Hop go off to frolic around, this silicobra just slowly slithers off in the distance. Well, that was awkward. Oh, Jesus! On Route 6, we can find our next encounter, which is a 2% chance to find in the grass here, but we eventually get one, a Halucha, which we catch and nickname Ayla. Ayla has a naughty nature, nice, plus attack and minus special defense. Any plus attack is fine by me. I replace Leia for now, since it doesn't evolve until level 38 anyway. We can also find the light clay item to extend the duration of light screen and reflect, which should be very useful. In Stow on side, we have another battle with Hop, and his Cramorant is handled well by Gyarados, especially with Intimidate, but it did paralyze us with its ability as we KO'd it. His new Toxel is a threat, but it only has Nuzzle at this point, which is very low power, so we can handle it with four times effective Bulldoze, which I taught to Ventress via TM. Our newly evolved Youngling then handles Drizzile quite well, whereas our newly obtained Ayla destroys Silicobra, which could only hit us with a resisted Dark-type move at best. After obtaining Fly from a house nearby, it's time for the fourth gym. Upon defeating the gym trainers, I cannot take grinding anymore, so even though we're a bit below the level cap, I challenge gym leader Bea. This is a fighting type gym after all, so I'm not super worried. She leads with a hip on top, and I send in Ventress to get the Intimidate off on it. I then immediately switch into Greedo, who four times resists fighting, and begin to start setting up Hardens for our Baton Pass strategy. Hitmontop does bring us below half in the process, but thanks to our Citrus Berry, we can use three of them and Baton Pass into Halucha, who is an absolute nightmare for her team. I use Honeclaw a few times, that way our attack and accuracy can raise so Fly won't miss anymore, and then I proceed to sweep her entire team with Fly, and that includes her Gigantamaxima champ too. A flawless effort, Xana. Four badges. Youngling then handles a rogue bead really well, and Sonya loses her mind from the mural collapsing, and we arrive in the beautiful little town of Balan Lee. After handing this guy a letter from the little girl in Hammerlock, who he says is supposed to be long dead, the girl in the corner is apparently mad at us for being rude by interrupting her conversation. Her convers- what? Who? <laughs> Alright, I'm out of here. I travel back to Hammerlock to purchase the stupid fire outfit for a particular reason. This guy back in Balan Lee gives you the acrobatics TM if you have it on. Don't ask why, all I know is it's a great flying TM for us, doubling in power if the user isn't holding an item. With that, it's time for the fifth gym. Knowing it's a fairy gym and that the level cap is now 38, I decide to actually deposit Xana since it's a fighting type and pick up Leia again, who, after some grinding, evolves into a beastly Corviknight, which is part steel, and learns Steel Wing, which is perfect for us. I also use a body press TR on it, and you'll see why in a second. After passing her ridiculous audition, it's time for the fairy type gym leader, Opal. I was initially worried about this battle, but I think Corviknight is a great answer for her. She leads with a Galarian Weezing, and I lead with Greedo. I can only manage two Hardens before Baton passing into Leia, and we're immune to the predicted sludge. From here, I can use Home Claws, and Opal's stupid quiz questions also give you stat boost if you get them correct, so Corviknight quickly becomes nearly indestructible as Weezing goes down to Steelwing. In comes Mawile now though, which not only has Intimidate, but is not hit super effectively by Steel despite being part Fairy type, but now, with a raised defenses, Body Press is able to one-hit KO. From here, her Togekiss actually survives a Steel Wing, hits Ancient Power, and gets the Omni Boost, but Leia is basically the Omni Boost master at this point and takes it out with another. Her final Pokemon is a Gigantamax birthday cake, and Leia's feeling pretty hungry and devours it all in one bite. Poor thing. Oh sh**. Beat, watch out! On the Route 7 bridge, Hop interrupts us and starts a battle with us that we apparently can't decline. Uh-oh. He leads with Trevenon as Greedo is sent out on our side. We get taken to just a third by a crit shadow claw before we can take it out with acrobatics. He sends in a heat more next and Poe is a great counter for it, taking it down in one water pulse. However, he next sends out a Bolton, which I completely forgot that he has. I send in Leia, who tanks it with over half, but the most that we can do is Steel Wing for about a quarter. Then it uses Roar and sends in Greedo again. Oh, that was the worst possible switch. I'm then forced to hard switch into Youngling, and Spark does more than half and paralyzes. I switch into Kanata now, and he goes for Crunch, which does less than half. I desperately need to get a Reflect up here, but Spark actually does enough damage to take down Kanata from there. Rest in peace, my sweet warrior. Kanata was actually my plan for the next gym too, so... not good. 
I have no choice now, so I send in Gyarados with Intimidate, and four times super effective Stabbed Spark actually just barely doesn't take us out, so I Dragon Dance and then can outspeed and take it down with Crunch. After all that, he sends in a new Snorlax, but thankfully Leia is able to handle it quite well by resisting Body Slam and using Body Press in return with the help of its Citrus Berry. His last Pokemon is Inteleon, and we just barely survived two Snipe Shots on 8 HP to take it down in two Drill Packs. Wow, that was tough. Route 8 brings about a new encounter for us, a Rufflet, which we catch, and it ends up having a Brave Nature, plus attack and minus speed, which is interesting. I name it Kylo and box it for now as it doesn't evolve until level 54. Once we get the Brick Break TM, I teach it to Ayla, which should be much better than 80% accuracy submission with recoil that we've been using. With that, we arrive in Churchester, the location of our next gym battle. In the city, we can solve the mystery of the eaten berries by accusing a Squovid of the crime to get the Wide Lens. Weirdest item acquisition ever. And we can also pick up a Focus Ash from some Karate Dude. It's time for the Rock-type gym leader, Gordy, and his team is absolutely devastating for us with Rock moves everywhere and Shell Smash Barbarical is a big yikes. I spent a lot of time theory crafting for this one and came up with a plan. Let's hope it pays off. He leads with Barbarical and I lead with Ayla. I go for Brick Break off the bat, which does do over half, but then he goes for Shell Smash. I know he's going to outspeed us now, and he goes for Razor Shell with massive power, but I had put the Focus Sash on Ayla, so we barely survive and can then take it out with another hit. Whew. In comes Shuckle now, and I switch into Poe here, who gets hit by Rock Tomb to lower its speed as well. However, I don't plan to keep this thing in. With the rain up, I switch into Ventress now, whose Intimidate helps soften the blow of Stone Edge, although it got a crit to almost half. Ventress just learned Dragon Dance recently, so I use it once, get hit by Stone Edge too low, so now I have to use Waterfall to take out Shuckle. With the power of the Expert Belt, Rain, Stab, and Super Effectiveness, Waterfall is then able to KO his Stone Journer, and is 4 times super effective against his Gigantamax Colossal, so it's a 1 hit KO on it as well. A crazy strat and some close calls, but it paid off for sure. Sonya invites us on another date for winning too, so that's always nice. After defeating Hop in Battle Deathless, this time actually having been prepared for his battle, we make it to Route 8 where we finally get the upgrade to our bike that lets us traverse across water. Here we can also pick up another encounter, a Mantine named Grievous, which has a brave nature which is terrible, so I doubt we'll use it, but it's worth catching just in case. We arrive at Spikemuth and are challenged by Marnie, but this time we have Ayla who's able to Swords Dance while her Lipar just nasty plots, and then we can use our newly learned Flying Press move, which is both Fighting and Flying type at the same time, to absolutely sweep through her entire Dark and Fighting team. Incredible. Take that, Marnie. That's for my boy Han. Once Team Yell is taken care of, we can challenge the 7th Gym Leader, Piers, and I had a perfect strategy for him. He leads with Scrafty, so I lead with Ayla. And he uses Fake Out on the first turn to flinch us, and then I can just use Encore so that he's locked into that, and it of course does nothing unless it's the user's first turn on the field, so he's just stuck there for 3 turns doing no damage, and I can Swords Dance and then sweep through his entire Dark Team with Flying Press. Amazing stuff. Realizing we're still wearing the stupid fire outfit, I decide to be a bit more professional up in here by buying the whole flying set. Ah, much better. With that, it's time to head back to Hammerlock for the 8th and final gym. A dragon gym led by none other than Rai... Alright, I'm gonna say Raihan? I don't think anybody knows how to pronounce this, to be fair. I specifically remember his team being a nightmare during my first playthrough, and it looks like it might be even worse for a flying team. I come up with the best strategy I can and go for it. Raihan's battle is a double battle and he leads with Flygon and Gigalith which starts the Sandstorm as I lead with Ventress and Leia. Ventress does get the Intimidate off to lower both their attacks which is great and I go for Dragon Dance and well, I made a mistake. You can literally see me realizing it. I thought I taught Leia Reflect but it turns out it was Protect. Oh no, not good at all since his Flygon has Thunder Punch. But there's nothing I can do now. Flygon hits Ventress for two-thirds damage, we get Dragon Dance off, then Gigalith goes for Stealth Rock. Oof. I go for Ice Fang to outspeed and take Flygon down in one hit, hit Gigalith for about half with Body Press, then it hits Leia for minimal damage. In comes Sandaconda, and I go for Waterfall to take Gigalith out since Sandaconda has little it can hit Gyarados with anyway, and Drill Peck does about a quarter on Sandaconda. In comes Duraludon, and had Gyarados not just been paralyzed, we would have been okay, but now I'm forced to switch, so I send in Ayla. Duraludon Gigantamaxes and hits Ayla for big damage, Body Press does little on it, and then Leia gets hit by Glare. 
I next go for Flying Press, and now that Leia is paralyzed, it gets outsped, and Max Rockfall takes Ayla down. Ouch. From here, I switch in Youngling, who takes Duraludon down with Shadow Ball, and then Sandaconda is a slow process with double paralysis and protect, but we eventually wear it down for the win. Man, oh man. I was wondering why Ayla didn't do as much damage as I expected, and it turns out I had accidentally given it the Muscle Band instead of the Expert Belt. Well, these sorts of things happen in Hardcore Nuzlocks. At least we now have all eight badges. Before we head to Winden, I hit up the wild area to buy a couple things from the Watt vendors. I buy a wishing piece and also the Scald TR, which is an incredible move for Pelipper. Now why the wishing piece, you might ask? Well, it's for a new encounter in the Hammerlock Hills part of the wild area. It's quite a complex Pokemon to have spawn, and the method is kind of crazy, but basically you need to get a purple beam on the den. After about 20 minutes, we're able to get the correct one, and the spawn is none other than a Charmeleon. After taking it down, we're able to capture it, and I nickname it Vader. Vader ends up having a timid nature, which is pretty much ideal. Amazing stuff. After grinding it a bit, Vader ends up evolving into a beastly Charizard, a Pokemon that I rarely get to use in playthroughs, so I'm excited for this. I use the Glimwood Tangle Pokemon to EV train it in Special Attack, followed by the Pokemon on the Snowy Route 10 for some speed EVs. After making it through, we arrive at our final destination, Winden City. Here, we can finally buy some vitamins from the Pokemon Center to top up our EVs, or at least as much as we can afford at the moment. With that, it's time to head to the stadium for the Champion Cup. The first battle we have is against Marnie. Now, Marnie's battle, well, as Mr. Antler Boy and I have discussed at great length, she's very easy to strategize around. Yeah, surprisingly, she's even easier to beat than you'd be if we were to compete in a Nuzlocke. Alright, that's it. Last time I'm having that guy on. But basically, Marnie starts off with a Lipard, and its only attacking moves are Fake Out and Snarl, making it perfect setup bait. I essentially just send out Greedo and stack up Hardens and Speed Boost, and then just Leech Life for the one-hit KO. Because of the Torment, I have to use Harden again against Morpico, get hit by Spark, but then Leech Life just recovers our health. Scrafty is then a one-hit with Acrobatics, and the same goes for her Toxicroak, although another Harden caused us to get Poison. Her Grimmsnarl then comes out and Gigantamaxes, but this is the perfect time to Baton Pass to Leia, who's immune to Toxic of course, and who tanks G-Max Snooze well, uses Home Claws, and then Steel Wing for massive damage, but then we get put to sleep by the next one, but it returns to regular form before we can then wake up and take it down with a Drill Pack after Torment. A solid battle. The last semi-final match is against Hop, our rival. He starts with a double, and I lead with Gyarados. Not only do we get the Intimidate here, but its best move against us is Body Slam. I start Dragon Dancing as it uses Cotton Guard, and then on its first Body Slam it gets the Paralysis, but I had prepared with a Cherry Berry. After a few more Dragon Dances, we take it down in a couple Waterfalls, then good thing I retaught Gyarados Bulldoze, as that was quite literally our only way of dealing with his Pinch Urchin. From there, we sweep through his Corviknight and Snorlax with Waterfall. Ventress is an absolute legend. However, I had forgotten that Hop actually Dynamaxes his Inteleon here, and we barely don't KO with the Waterfall. It uses max darkness, but we survive on just 8 HP and can outspeed to take it down on the next turn. Wow, that was close. With the semifinals over, I head over to this guy in Winden, who I realize can actually teach Charizard the Blast Burn move. I'm thinking this might be useful in the near future. After trying to save the world with a rock concert in the middle of an active train station? Even this guy's like, what in the absolute f*** is going on here? Our next objective is to climb the battle tower, where at the top we have to battle Oleana. Her team is well-rounded and quite scary for us, but I come up with a strategy and teach Leia Light Screen and give her the Light Clay item. Let's test this out. She leads with Frostlass, and I lead with Vader, who's able to instantly one-hit KO it with Flamethrower. A good start. In comes Milotic next, and although Gyarados seems like a good option, it has the competitive ability, so any stat lowering, such as from Intimidate, would raise its special attack, which would not be good. Instead, I switch into Leia and get hit by Surf for about a third, and then use Light Screen. I then use Home Claws and go for Drill Pack, which does a bit less than half. It does have Recover, which is annoying, but a couple more do the trick. Salazzle comes out next, which is a great opportunity to send Vader back in since he can't get burned. Thankfully, we even flinch it with our first Air Slash and can KO it with another. Our light screen then wears off as Serena comes in next, and I know I need to prepare for her next Pokemon, so I send in Youngling who gets hit hard by Acrobatics. 
From here though, I start using Stockpile to raise our defenses, and our leftovers help us get 3 off, surviving on just 23 HP before leftovers. And now, since we outspeed, I can use Baton Pass to pass the defense boost to Gyarados, who gets the Intimidate off on the Switch too. Now, I can start Dragon Dancing, being brought to just above half after 3 before we use Ice Fang. We get a lot of Shell Bell recovery after the KO, and in comes Garbodor. This is the only way I could think of handling this thing, as it is a beast, and Bulldoze still doesn't KO, and its weak armor activated to raise its speed, but thankfully Max Rockfall brings us to just half, and after our Dragon Dances, we still manage to outspeed and take it down with another. We next return to the stadium for what are called the Finals Matches to determine who will challenge the champion. The first three trainers, although they have updated teams, we kind of handled in a somewhat similar way as before. Against Bead, we used Greedo to stack up Defense Curls with the help of a Citrus Berry, then Baton Pass those to Leia, who can shed the Intimidate, which does get passed, with Home Claws, then sweep her team with a combination of Body Press and Steel Wing. Against Nessa, Galissapod was a new threat, but Greedo worked well against it, getting some Hardens up, although we did get our Defense drop once by Liquidation, cutting my plan short. From there, I Baton Passed into Youngling, who could then use Stockpile, and then further Baton Pass all of those boosts from both of them to Gyarados, who performed a sick Dragon Dance sweep afterwards, and her Pelipper's Drizzle even helped us out in a way too. In the end, after our berry, we were left with a bit less than half health, being able to smash her newly Gigantamax Dreadnought too. Bea was then quite an easy task too with her fighting types, as Ventress could just be sent out against her Hawlucia for the Intimidate, and then knowing it would use Bounce, we can use its turns in the air for Dragon Dancing, after which we could sweep her entire team with Waterfall. The last trainer we have to face in the finals is none other than Raihan, this time in a scary single battle. This battle required a lot of forethought, and I planned as best as I could, but nothing seemed certain. He leads with a Torkoal, and I lead with Gyarados to hit it with the Intimidate. Torkoal starts the sun with Drought, and I knew if I sent out Pelipper for the rain, we outspeed it, so its Drought would technically happen after and outdo our rain. And I did the calcs, even a lagging tail wouldn't make us slow enough. From here, I switch into Poe to start the rain, and Torkoal goes for Solar Beam, which now locks it in for two turns, giving me an opportunity to switch in Ventress and start Dragon Dancing like a madman. Eventually, Torkoal uses Yawn on us, but I had prepared with a Chesto Berry to wake us up. Knowing I cannot let it use Yawn again, this was my indication to strike, so I take it down with Waterfall. From here, his Gudra goes down to Ice Fang, his Turtonator to Waterfall in the rain, his Flygon to 4 times super effective Ice Fang, and in comes his Duraludon, which promptly Gigantamaxes. Now, I know there's nothing I can switch in that can do any damage to this thing, and if it goes for Max Knuckle to raise its attack, that's the end. Especially since it has a surprising 85 speed stat. With all the boosts that we have on this thing, I know I have to go for it, so I hit it with Bulldoze, it doesn't do enough, then Ventures gets smashed with a Max Rockfall for the KO. That sacrifice was something I realized might be necessary depending on when Torkoal uses Yawn. From here, I can send in Leia, who, now that Duraludon has huge damage on it, is able to tank it out with Reflect combined with a few body presses. Ventress will go down as an absolute legend. Noibat, welcome back to the team. Right before the final battle with Leon, Rose interrupts and we're forced to battle him. With his entire team being Steel types, we have a perfect answer, Charizard. I attach the Expert Belt and watch Vader go on an absolute slaughter, the likes of which give credence to his nickname, taking down the first four Pokemon with ease. Now, I knew Rose's Gigantamax Copperaja would survive a flamethrower, so this is the reason why I gave Charizard Blast Burn for the extra needed power. We just need it to land with the 90% accuracy. And we do to destroy a Gigantamax unboosted. What a beast. With that, the main villain of the games is 6 0 in a sweep. Legendary. After defeating Eternamax Eternatus and saving the region, it's time to prepare for the ultimate battle. During the four hour grind of getting experience candies from raids, Noibat finally evolves into a Noivern, which should be a great help. I also EV train like crazy using vitamins, and I used all the watts from raids to go to the digging duo to dig up a ton of treasures we could sell for big money. After five hours of preparation, we're not quite at the level cap, but I physically could not take any more grinding. Let's see what we can do, it's all or nothing. Leon, the champion of Galar, starts off with an Aegislash and I lead with Vader. My calcs tell me Flamethrower won't do the job, so I hit it with Blast Burn, and after it protects itself on the first turn, it hits successfully on the second, immediately KOing it. In comes his Dragapult next. I have nothing I can switch into this thing's Thunderbolt, and Blast Burn requires a recharge, so Vader goes down to Thunderbolt. 
However, this gives us the opportunity to switch in Xana, who gets outsped and hit with Dragon Breath to below half before instantly KOing Dragapult with Dragon Pulse. In comes his Haxorus, as I was expecting since it has super effective moves against us, but we outspeed and are super powerful, so we one-hit KO it with Dragon Pulse. Cinderace comes out next, and honestly, there's not really a good opportunity we'll get to switch into Xana again, so I go for Dragon Pulse, which does a good amount, then it hits us with Acrobatics. But Xana survives on just 14 HP, and I got way too excited and forgot that this thing had a priority quick attack, so Xana goes down. From here, I can safely send out Poe, though, to start the rain, and I decide to use Stockpile to raise our defenses after getting hit by Acrobatics. It hits us one more time to about half, before Skull then takes it out. Leon then sends out Seismitoad, and I decide to go for Roost as it uses Toxic. I use Hurricane, which is 100% accuracy in the rain, and it does big damage, but he gets the defense drop on us on the next liquidation. Now, I know his Charizard will come out next, Toxic is building up, and our rain is about to end, so I pivot to Leia, who gets hit for about half, then we get hit again to 43 HP before I set up Light Screen, and then Leia is taken down on the next turn. I send out Youngling here and use Shadow Ball, hoping that the Seismitoad will actually hurt us to below half, so our berry activates Unburdened to raise our speed, but he instead goes for Toxic, and then our next Shadow Ball just barely doesn't KO, which allows him to indeed smash us with Liquidation, after which I can take him out. Leon's final Pokemon and Ace is none other than a Gigantamax Charizard, which is nothing less than a monster, and I am feeling very worried here. We outspeed and hit him with Shadow Ball, but it does almost nothing before we're taken out with Max Rockfall. Oh god. Here, I send in Poe to restart the rain, and with the light screen up, I'm desperately hoping we can survive an attack, and we do on just 26 HP, but Max Rockfall restarts the sand, so Scald no longer gets a boost and isn't able to take him out. Amazingly, after Sandstorm and Toxic damage, Pelipper survives on 6 HP though, and now he has to waste his last Gigantamax turn, taking us down with another move. This opens up an opportunity to send in Ninjask, and this is it. We outspeed, and normal form Charizard gets smashed and taken down by Acrobatics. Wow, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Sword with only flying types, and what a crazy and messy ride it was. If you enjoyed the run, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button as it really helps a lot and grows our community. A huge thanks to my YouTube members and patrons who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support and get your name up here, the links are also down below. If you enjoyed, drop a like down below to help the video out and leave a comment letting me know what kind of run we should do next and I'll see you guys for our next challenge video.